Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming back from lunch. Thank you for um, the participation in this, um, in this next panel. My name is Chris Stone. Um, I am uh, this term a uh, visiting researcher here at uh, Mansfield and at the Bonavero Institute. Um, happy to be here and happy very much um, to be chairing this panel on civil society. Um, let me say we are going to um, follow a um, somewhat similar format. We're going to have a discussion among the uh, panelists for the first um, ha roughly half of the program and then I hope engage many of you in conversation. I do want to remind you as it was uh, as was stated in the invitation to the event that this is being live streamed um, and that means if you do ask a question um, our wonderful colleagues will be chasing after you afterwards to get your um, signed permission but simply asking the question is your expression of permission um, to, be, uh, to be broadcast. So please, if you don't want to be uh, included in the live stream, please yeah. don't ask a question during uh, the formal part of the session. Um, the, uh, um, on, May, on May 15th, 1940, a year that for much, much to my surprise has come up a couple of times uh, today, um, but on May 15, 1940, uh, Ralph Bunch, then probably the preeminent African-American political scientist in the United States, the chair of the political science department at Howard University, um, uh, took a taxi to the White House um, where he interviewed Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, and he was working at the time on a study for uh, Gunnar Myrtle, um, paid for by the Carnegie Corporation on the state of African-Americans in the United States and the uh, issues of racism. Um, he interviewed Eleanor Roosevelt in 1940 because she was um, concerned with these issues. She, had, um, she was to be a board member of the NAACP um, and in many other ways uh, demonstrated her concern for um, the condition um, in which African Americans lived in the United States. But this was, of course, as we've heard already, in the midst of the war. Um, and uh, as they sat on the South Portico at the White House um, uh, having lunch, a um, uh, 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 bunch asked uh, Eleanor Roosevelt um, about the uh, prospects for the United States um, if the war continued as it was going then. Uh, she was worried. Uh, she said she expected actually Britain uh, to succumb to the Nazi assault. She said pl she told um, a bunch that plans were already laid for the government of the United Kingdom to retire to Canada. Um, and, um, and then she said, according to Bunch's uh, memo that he wrote immediately after the interview, um, she said that many Americans will be attracted by the amazing success of the Nazi system. And she worried that, um, that, the, uh, that the country um, would embrace, or large parts of the country, would embrace the fascist ideology that was um, uh, uh, triumphing in Europe. Um, she said, if not, again, quoting from a bunch's memo, if Nazism with its racial doctrines triumphs in Europe, the racial repercussions are quite likely to be felt very severely here. There is no doubt, she said, that a great many Americans would look with some favor upon a triumphant Nazism, simply because we are a people who tend to admire things that work. Um, it is a, um, she, she also um, said in that interview that the conditions of racial intolerance in the United States, um, the disregard for law and authority in the South, are weaknesses upon which Nazi doctrines might well prey. Um, unsurprisingly, Roosevelt was less concerned with the possibility of Nazi sympathies, sympathies um, among African Americans. Um, if the UN system and its human rights instruments were meant as a bulwark against this possibility, if eight years later the construction um, of this human rights uh, apparatus was meant to hold in check or reverse these sympathies, um, the role of civil society in that system is complicated. Roosevelt, as representing the US government, of course, was no fan of the direct role of civil society in the human rights system that they were constructing. 
Um, she voted, although having served on the board of the NAACP, she voted against um, the right of the NAACP and other organizations uh, representing minority groups around the world to petition directly to the UN, as they had been allowed to with the League of Nations, um, because they were worried um, about the infiltration of those civil society groups um, by actors who might be hostile um, to the United States. The, um, we've come a long way in the role of civil society in that human rights and UN system. Um, and indeed, it is almost inconceivable today to even think or talk or write um, or study the system of international relations and the protection of human rights um, without a central place given to the role of civil society. And it is probably that central role for civil society that so many governments today are actually pushing back on um, and um, uh, uh, jealous of the power um, that's been accumulating there. Uh, so we have a wonderful panel here today to talk about the state of that civil society apparatus um, as it experiences the pushback, but also as it plays its now quite robust role uh, in the protection of human rights. We're going to focus on three countries. Um, again, I will uh, follow uh, Tim's uh, wonderful uh, example. You have all the bios in your material, so I won't, uh, I won't repeat the, them here. Um, but we are, we are going to start with Osai, who is the head of the uh, Nigeria um, office, uh, the Nigeria Office of Amnesty International, a role she's had for about a year and a half. That office dates from 2015. Um, and we're then going to hear from Adam, who is the ombudsman, also known as the Commissioner for Human Rights in Poland, a post uh, he's held since September uh, 2015. And finally, from Annalen. Um, who is, um, I'm happy to say, um, a colleague of mine here at the Institute, the Director of Programs at the Institute, but also an expert and having spent a lot of time working uh, with civil society in Colombia on issues of transitional justice and other matters. And so we're going to focus really on Nigeria, on Poland, and Colombia, three very different pictures of the role and state of civil society um, uh, as uh, states push back on the role that they're playing. Um, we're going to do this as a conversation. We're going to start, really, I'm just going to ask um, each of our uh, panelists to say just briefly a few words about the challenges civil society in the country is facing, the attacks it's under, in some cases physical attacks, in some cases um, uh, verbal um, uh, uh, and, and other nefarious uh, devices. Um, I, um, uh, Osai, maybe you could start. I, I can't, uh, one of the things I was excited you might tell us about. Osai runs the Amnesty Chapter in Nigeria and has uh, encountered a lot of um, hostility recently from the military in Nigeria because of reports that Amnesty has been doing um, uh, on human rights abuses in the course of um, the fight, mostly in, in the north with Boko Haram. Um, and uh, the military arranged for a rather remarkable symbolic protest uh, of the Amnesty offices um, uh, in this last year, year and a half. Uh, parading a coffin, I think it is, up and down um, in, in the street to, to try and discredit the work that you were, you were doing. Maybe you could say a little bit about the kind of attacks you're finding, the kind of challenges you're finding in Nigeria, not one of the countries um, we usually list off as a place where civil society is under attack from an illiberal government. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, so sometime in um, March 2017, um, I get a text from a friend of mine asking, um, are you all right? Is everything OK? And I was like, yes, why wouldn't anything be um, fine at the moment? Um, and he said, have you seen the news? Um, there's protests um, in front of Amnesty's offices in Abuja. And he was asking, because at that point in time, had been offered the job to head the amnesty office. And he was asking, because he wanted to be sure, have you signed the papers? You still have time to change your mind. <laughs> you can stay in Kenya and do the fantastic work you're doing in the Pan-Africa program um, with Oxfam. And so I clicked on the link he had shared. Um, I read the story. I contacted 
um, colleagues had already established um, contact with at the International Secretariat asking what's going on. Is the office safe? Are people okay? And they said, yes, people are okay and we're still monitoring the situation. And they, they asked me, are you having any concerns? Do you want to talk about it? And I said, absolutely not. I think for me, the sign that um, people would go at such great lengths to try and discredit an organization that is doing great work to raise issues of critical importance at a critical juncture in Nigeria show that they are doing the right thing, they are pushing the right buttons. It's uh, annoying those who are actually perpetuating these crimes. And this is the best time ever to be in that position in order to frame and push for change in Nigeria. And as a Nigerian, I saw it as a call to duty also um, to be in a position in order to frame that discussion. And so without doubt, that didn't intimidate me in any way. But it did raise a sign of more things to come. And since then, we've had another protest in the office sometime in May 2018. And this time around, it preempted a report we are doing on um, sexual violence with women in the IDP camps in Nigeria. Nigeria currently has 1.3 million minimum IDPs, majority of them from um, the insurgency in the northeastern part of the country. And this is very important because Nigeria is comprised of 36 states. And the states that have provided the largest number of IDPs are from only three of those states, um, Bornu, Yobe, and Adamawa. So you can imagine three states in the entire 36 um, states of Nigeria producing 1.3 million. You can imagine if all the states experience similar conflict or similar crisis, how would this you know, kind of change the situation in the entire West Africa um, region. And so the report stated that the military and the civilian JTF, which is a sort of vigilante group that emerged as a response to Boko Haram, were sexually exploiting the women in the IDP camps and raping them. And the military didn't like that report. And they actually challenged Amnesty's uh, veracity of the reports. So, as usual, when we have a report lined up, we invite both the state authorities, civil society, to the launch. And um, two days to the launch, we had protesters in front of the office saying Amnesty must leave the country, we've created fictitious reports, we must be attacked, military are dying, and Amnesty is only concerned about spreading lies about the government and about the people, and that there were no women that had been raped. And if they were rape victims, Amnesty should produce them. As usual, people got panicked. There was a lot of fears because even though it appeared they were representing the communities we serve, we knew they were a paid group that had interests from the military backing them. And that was really, really scary considering Nigeria's background. Um, we had several years under military rule. And the military is still very much feared in Nigeria. And you can attack anyone, but not the military. So they thought we were actually on a suicide mission. And it didn't end with the paid protesters. They decided to begin a smear campaign online also for the first time against Amnesty International, whereby their, their trolls would go online and publish information about how I am supporting terrorists, how the Amnesty International group has been linked to a section of the Boko Haram splinter group, the Al Banawi faction, and how we are always trying to distract the government from their work by releasing these reports when the military is actually gaining grounds with Boko Haram. That for us was a big issue because um, under Nigeria's Terrorism Act, you can be arrested and held in communicado forever. We have people that have been held for six years, seven years, eight years, they've never been brought to court. And so being linked with Boko Haram was really the strongest message ever um, that the military could have pointed against um, me personally and against Amnesty International. And it was also an attempt to raise the public against what we stood for. But we acted very swiftly. We got all our friends, both 
locally, nationally, internationally to get on board. And there were several letters written to the authorities, to the president, to the Minister for Justice, calling for them to take a stand against this sort of abuse for the work we do. And we immediately called on the larger amnesty movement to state that, look, at this point in time, if we don't speak up on this issue against the Amnesty International Office in Nigeria, we run a risk of being driven out of the country, not because we are not Nigerians, but because we are being accused of terrorism. And so that created um, a reaction online as well. So we also had people pushing back, sharing stories of what Amnesty has done. Because if you'd follow the threads, there was lots of conversations around the good work Amnesty has done on our work on forced evictions, on our work on saving people from torture. But the greatest support we had was from the women themselves that we had reported the issues on. They had formed this network of community activists in the Northeast. And immediately after the military released those um, um, statements online, they came on as well. They used an hashtag at Kinifa Women um, to say that we were raped, we are here, and we're waiting for the authorities to come and take our testimony. And that changed the focus because people were now confused because the attempt was to show that we do not actually have any sort of credibility. We don't have any sort of real people who would come up boldly to say they've been raped. Culturally, religiously, rape is such a sensitive issue. And for a woman to come out and say, look at me, I am here, I've been raped, and it's by a powerful uh, person like a soldier in authority was very powerful indeed. And it showed us that for us to be able to survive in this very hostile environment, we need to make sure we're going along with the people and that the people are well aware of the rights that we are fighting for. Thanks, Thanks so much. Adam. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I would like to share some of my views concerning the situation of the civil society in, in, in Poland. You must know one thing, uh, I'm coming from the NGO background. So I was working for the leading Polish human rights NGO and was uh, promoted as a candidate to, to be ombudsman by more than 60 NGOs. So I still somehow feel like responsible for uh, being even in this uh, official position uh, as being responsible for the condition of the civil society. I would like to start by saying that there is a very good report by the Fundamental Rights Agency about uh, the shrinking space for the civil society in Europe. And I think uh, it gives like a good, a good image what is happening. So I, I wouldn't say that there is no freedom, there are no possibilities of exercising freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, uh, and so on. But basically, you can feel like every day that the space is shrinking. Uh, why? First of all, uh, we observe some situations of some smear campaigns, either against some NGOs that are dedicated to some issue, uh, or to some individual uh, activists. Uh, so even, you know, we, we discussed before our panel that like three months ago, uh, the leader of Polish section of Amnesty, Dra Draginia Nadazdin, was attacked just because of the fact that she uh, used, uh, she posted a tweet uh, uh, that basically police was using tear gas during one demonstration, and basically it amounts to degrading and inhuman uh, treatment. So there was a reaction by one Polish MP who is quite aggressive one, um, and, and she said basically, oh, you are Serbian, you should come back to Serbia to teach people, you know, what are human rights, you know, let's leave Poland alone. You know, in a situation when she's a Polish citizen, she's living for years, but basically like this, uh, uh, like this policy of naming and shaming. Um, and basically it happens from time to time that, that there are those verbal attacks on different, uh, of different leaders. Uh, they are not necessarily physical attacks, uh, but verbal attacks are quite uh, frequent, especially with the use of social media, uh, also with the use of the national television or national radio. So uh, I remember that uh, two years ago we had, for example, such a situation that some NGOs were depicted in the major news program as having some different connections with the judges of the Constitutional Court. So it was made in order to, uh, to undermine also the credibility of judges of the, uh, of the Constitutional Court. 
What, what is uh, existing is uh, there are some practices of surveillance of, uh, of leaders, uh, of NGOs. We don't know it for sure, but because the, the Polish regulations on surveillance are so extensive these days and there is nobody to control it because the Constitutional Court is not working uh, uh, properly. And also we do not have any independent oversight mechanism over uh, secret services. But, but I think, um, and there were some incidents that, that it must be a, a, a common uh, practice. Uh, of course, we can observe also a differentiation between so-called good NGOs and bad NGOs. So those bad NGOs, for sure, they will not be invited to public television. They will not get funding. Uh, so, for example, if you are dealing with domestic violence, uh, it means that uh, you will not get uh, any funding from the, uh, from the uh, state. Uh, interesting new aspect is that uh, there are one important uh, NGO these days is the Justitia, which is the Association of Polish Judges, which is a little bit like the trade union, but for for judges and leaders of those of this trade union uh, of this uh, judicial association are also targeted. So uh, two weeks ago, they were called to the disciplinary prosecutor to ask about their different statements and engagements into into judicial um, uh, protests. There is one important, uh, let's say, development of the civil society because you know before 2015, most of the NGOs were very much traditional, like I would say, like in a typical. Uh, Western countries, so nice office, maybe less nice office, you know, a lot of grassroots organizations, uh, different f um, uh, funds, grants, and so on, like a typical, uh, typical work. Right now, we see like the emergence of so-called um, civil disobedience and the NGOs, mm -hmm. and the, 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 the general name they, they put for themselves is like they are so-called street opposition. So they engage into different counter demonstrations. They, they are very much active in making different uh, protests. And as a consequence, they are targeted by the police. Uh, and also, like the leading organization of this kind is also subject of a procedure for closing it down for apparently some irregular, uh, irregularities in the, uh, concerning the operation of this uh, organization. Last point, uh, we observe uh, something what I would name like the horizontal threat. So not necessarily the state which is attacking or state institutions that are uh, attacking or targeting NGOs, but some friendly NGOs, some neo-fascist NGOs, obviously, uh, but also Christian fundamentalist uh, uh, organizations. Especially there is one organization, the name is Ordo Iuris, which is extremely, I would say, powerful uh, in terms of making different advocacy uh, actions uh, against some issues, against some um, uh, topics, but also against some uh, some institutions. So, so, uh, and and the government is, I would say, quite happy from time to time to take advantage of that kind of uh, support which is given by by some other fellow citizens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Colombia, of course, uh, has suffered from a 50-year-old conflict where lots of victims uh, were possibly displaced, um, disappeared, and murdered. So um, that nowadays they speak of 8.5 million victims in total and 260,000 murders, the vast majority of which were civilians, 80%. And um, this is all in the context of uh, underlying social political violence, which has been going on in Colombia. Um, and um, one of the historic characteristics of the armed conflict has been that many leaders, opposition leaders, human rights defenders, were being assassinated. And that has, is continuing until today and has even worsened. So in November 2016, um, the peace agreement was signed between the leftist FARC guerrilla and the Colombian government. And since then, uh, um, violence um, against civilians, but also sort of armed violence between the different armed actors um, has decreased. But on the other hand, violence against human rights defenders has largely increased. So that nowadays, um, to, to, today, from looking at the past two and a half years, since 2016, around 450 human rights defenders have been assassinated. Um, and almost every um, third day a human rights defender is being killed and murdered in um, Colombia. So that is a really worrying um, tendency right now. Um, and um, besides, and especially also because they know how, how and whom to target, um, so they're especially focusing on social leaders from the remote areas, territories, um, leaders who are standing up for environmental rights, um, for land rights. 
um, and uh, who don't have a lot of protection or international visibility. And I hope we'll get a chance to discuss mm -hmm. possible strategies for protection afterwards. Um, and besides this very physical threat, uh, there are also death threats which uh, human rights defenders receive on a very frequent basis, a general um, climate of harassment of smear campaigns, as Asai was mentioning, um, defamation, stigmatization, also by state officials, which is part of the problem because then illegal armed groups feel encouraged to actually carry out um, these false, or to follow lead, or t take lead of the uh, false uh, um, stigmatizations and uh, take to arms and assassinate human rights defenders. Um, and then there are also sort of changing uh, additional measures which are being taken to stop human rights defenders from criticizing um, the government and other entities who are violating human rights, such as criminal prosecutions against human rights defenders who find themselves in jail, but also disciplinary actions against lawyers claiming that they are um, taking advantage of damages which they might be gaining in the inter-American human rights system from cases filed against Colombia. Um, there's, there are huge illegal surveillance um, campaigns c carried out uh, by um, state secret services in the past when still um, other groups including phone tapping so that human rights defenders can never be sure of how to uh, communicate amongst each other and what to say in what situation. There's also a criminalization of social protest uh, more generally and lots of police brutality against demonstrators. And there are legislative proposals to try to limit um, the great advances which were achieved in the progressive peace agreement to the bare minimum, especially with the new um, government which was just uh, taking place now in, uh, in August. Um, and the state has had a range of responses to that. So the Ombudsman's Office, yeah. for example, uh, has been quite proactive and criticizes that growing threat and the growing number of human rights defenders being assassinated um, and has an early warning system and risk alerts, but uh, it's often not enough and coming too late. But then on the other hand, there are, as I was mentioning, um, other entities of the state who are stigmatizing and even more endangering the work of human rights defenders and civil society actors. Um, and um, one point which sort of makes it a vicious circle is that there's a lot of impunity. So the prosecutor's office is not doing enough to investigate those crimes and to really ask who is benefiting from assassinations of human rights defenders, who is benefiting from silencing those critical voices. So that is really one of um, the big issues which uh, needs to be addressed. Um, and also the uh, Colombian state is quite good in creating many norms to, to say that they are protecting human rights defenders and to, to show on paper that they are doing something in order um, to take care of this grave issue. But um, the implementation is often a huge problem and, um, and so that's also where international support is much needed and I hope we'll get a chance to discuss that. So let's move from this picture of the attacks, everything ranging from assassination, the, the implicit threat of prosecution under terrorism laws, um, everything from funding to, to exclusion and the threat of arrest in Poland. Um, those, those pressures, and we could, we could tour the globe and we would mm -hmm. find a, a, a similar and probably expanded catalog uh, in, many, in many countries. I mean, I, I ask a personal question here. I, I grew up in, in um, in New York City um, in the 1960s and um, watched um, as a very young protester um, civil rights and anti-war organizers um, become distracted from their cause in order to defend their own organizations against the attacks of the FBI and others that were trying to undermine their role um, at that time um, uh, in advance of civil rights and peace. Um, the, and I've always, wor since my whole life, I've worried that the attacks on civil society and the defense on those attacks would continue to distract us um, from the actual mission and the work of advancing the rights of all in society and um, continuing the advocacy. So I want to ask each of you, um, as these attacks come in each of these countries, how are the civil society organizations, yours or others, how, how are, are you able to continue to 
uh, do the core work to advance, to advance the issue um, without being distracted, but of course also while attending um, to the attacks that you're facing. Anyone? Yeah. Yeah, um, I think for me that's one of the greatest challenges I have. Um, it's something I struggle with um, about doing the work and the work that needs to be done, but at the same time protecting myself, protecting my team, and I find these attacks really as a distraction. And um, one way um, we have adopted um, um, a strategy in Amnesty in Nigeria is to be very clear in terms of um, the priorities we want to do for the quarter. It's very easy for you to move straight on to something that has happened, to what we call reactive work. And we have um, communities um, who participate in some of the prioritization sessions we have at the beginning of the year. And we say, what research do we want to do? How do we want to go about it? What do we need to put in place in order for this to be a success? <coughs> And we stick at it no matter what happens. We say even if heaven falls, even if a bomb is thrown right here in Abuja, know that you must go on to do that work because there are people relying on us. I think that motivation that there are people relying on us actually forces us to, to focus. But because we know these distractions we come, we've had to also develop a reactionary plan. So what happens if someone gets arrested, we have to respond to a newspaper campaign. Something always happens in Nigeria. And so we've had to be a bit more agile and to nominate someone. Um, so within the team, everyone has a role to play every month. So this month, you are the agile uh, marshal. So if anything happens, whatever else you're doing, it's your job to make sure that we can address that while at the same time keeping an eye um, on the ball. Um, sometimes we succeed, um, but there are times when we fail and we do get distracted, but then it's about also checking in regularly to make sure we're back um, um, on track. So for, for me, that's really the biggest challenge um, we face in our work. Uh, it's a long story because, you know, there are so many things happening, but I will just tell you about uh, two examples. Uh, for us, uh, what is important is that uh, this fight for the future of Poland is not only about uh, uh, how we'll uh, continue on this, on this way, but it is also a fight for the historical narrative. So basically, um, the current uh, government, including Mr. Kaczynski, you know, they tend to claim that they are like real leaders of solidarity, while uh, there are plenty of leaders of solidarity, including Lech Wałęsa, who claim that, uh, sorry, you cannot basically steal uh, our, uh, our transformation and everything that happened between 80 and, uh, and now. But, but what, it, what does it mean? It means also that some of the strategies that are employed these days are, to a certain extent, taking advantage of this moral integrity and strength from 70s and 80s. Interesting. So like, for example, there, is, uh, there was a famous attorney, Maciej Dibua. Okay, he was uh, famous because he represented dissidents during communist times. Okay, and his son, Jacek Dibois, is right now representing you know all the judges and other people who are harassed by the current uh, by the current government. Oh, in the uh, 70s we had a uh, in 76 an uh, organization which preceded the solidarity movement, which was called Committee to Protect Workers. So now we have a Committee to Pre Protect Justice which is mostly about representing uh, judges uh, and observing trials in all uh, those problems concerning judicial independence, but of course which is formed uh, according to new rules uh, on the basis of coalition of different uh, NGOs and people who are involved, but also people who are basically believing in, the, uh, in this very strong historical, uh, historical cause. Um, so, uh, and I think like looking back to the, to the history, uh, is in this situation very, uh, very important. I remember when, once again, I will come back to Amnesty, when Amnesty was uh, attacked for the first time in Poland in 2016, I was presenting my annual report to the parliament uh, and, uh, and somebody asked me about, oh, what are you thinking about Amnesty and that, that the leader was participating in some demonstration. And, and I said, listen, but the same Amnesty was defending political prisoners in the 70s and 80s. 
and you have to respect this organization because without this organization we wouldn't have a freedom here in Poland. And I, and I think that uh, remembering about the past and this moral strength of the Helsinki movement, uh, of the Solidarity movement, of all those readers uh, uh, who are still engaged is something really uh, important to the, to the cause uh, uh, these days. That's great. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that this attempt to distract is not only an attempt, but a whole strategy behind it, right? Exactly. To keep us from doing the work we actually want to do and to, to, um, to make human rights offenders focus on something else and not carry out the function they have in civil society and to really help consolidate the rule of law and make democracy real. Um, so, um, so yeah, it is definitely a threat, but, um, and in Colombia, of course, Human rights organizations have to function differently. They have to think about how they communicate and what ways. They have to think about security measures. They have often blinded cars they have to drive around with and security around, around them. Um, and also think about international accompaniment, such as peace brigades or international organizations, also other embassies from other countries um, who can play a role. Um, so that's, of course, something else on their plate to consider. But um, overall, I think in Colombia, it is quite a robust civil society, which does still carry out the functions as it works. And it, it makes use of um, the international framework to a large place, but also um, of the Colombian constitution, which is quite progressive from 1991, um, and uh, con con uh, Constitutional Court of Colombia, which has also had some very progressive judgments. So I think you know they find their ways. And nowadays, despite of the threats and the assassinations going on currently, um, the peace agreement also offers many new tools they can use to actually um, get the real subjects we talked about, to really address the root causes of this long ongoing social political violence. Um, and so I think it's also a chance, and they see it as a chance, um, to, to change um, many things which are going wrong in Colombia and to use instruments such as the new Druze Commission, a special jurisdiction for peace, to address the matters of persecution of human rights defenders and social leaders, but also to advance real issues of inequality, of land rights, um, environmental issues, and many more. That's great. It's, um, you mentioned the Constitution. It's come up a couple of times. I think, as Secretary Clinton said in, the, in, the, um, in her keynote, a lot of the, a lot of the work following the Universal Declaration was the incorporation of many of these rights into constitutions all, all over the world with the hope that you could claim the rights by claiming um, your constitutional rights yeah. um, and not needing to reach only um, to a um, less immediate, less well-enforced um, international standard. Um, I suppose the, the hope is that, that maybe constitutional rights would, would um, uh, become all you need well, that's clearly not the case. Um, uh, we still need them. I'm curious: is the human right, is the is the language of human rights, is the is, is the human rights apparatus still useful in these very content these contentious con uh, contexts um, in these three countries? Are is civil society able to use, and do they speak in terms of human rights, or as Secretary Clinton said, speak in other in other language? Um, about uh, trust, about, um, about decency, or about constitutional rights. Um, uh, how, how, do you see the, how do you see the relevance and the power of the human rights language and framework itself playing out in the, um, under these attacks? Should I start maybe okay, to yes, maybe this through way. Colombia? Yeah. <laughs> um, so in Colombia, it's absolutely uh, very much useful human rights language. It's essential. That's really how they argue their cases. Maybe it also has to do with the fact that the inter-American human rights system is such a strong regional human rights body. Um, so, um, uh, and also the United Nations are quite present in Colombia. There's an office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights in Colombia, and uh, he plays a big role as well in what's, what's going on in Colombia. And as I said, also the Constitution has a very progressive Bill of Rights, has mechanisms of a constitutional complaint mechanism to call to teller, which um, does permit to address many of, of 
the issues regarding human rights and judges also look at um, the jurisprudence of international rights bodies. So um, I would say that, yeah, in, in Colombia, absolutely, that's still the language that is being used. Um, and, um, and yeah, very progressively also uh, evolving new ideas of human rights. Um, so, um, so yeah, I think Colombia is still a case where it does still work, the language of human rights. Can you give us a quick example of a, of a new idea of human <laughs> rights? So, for example, what I really uh, like from recent uh, jurisprudence of the Constitution Court is that they recognize the rights of a river and also of the Amazon rainforest as such. So not only individuals who, can, uh, who need protection, but also um, elements of nature which very much need protection. And um, so I think that's quite progressive. Yeah. Adam. Okay. Uh, three points. First of all, uh, what we needed in the, in the beginning of protests in 2016, uh, and in fact un, uh, until protests in July to 2017, was something that would connect different groups. Because we had a number of opposition groups, opposition parties, uh, NGOs, civil disobedience groups, but basically everybody was like protesting for almost all about the same, but something else. And what became a unifying factor was the symbol uh, which says Constitutia. So we have such a t-shirt which says Constitutia, but two words are underlined, T and Ya, which means in Polish you and I. Uh, so basically it says that Constitution is for you and for me. And, and basically, right now, this symbol became almost like a solidarity symbol. So this is something, you know, if you wear this T-shirt or, um, uh, or if you put it somewhere, you know, it's, it's just like, uh, like the symbol of the opposition towards the, the regime. And people are uh, also becoming quite smart how to use this symbol uh, in a way that the government cannot easily uh, protest. So the, the recent action was made that uh, activists started to put this t-shirt on different monuments. And then the police had a problem. So should we take it down or not? Because you know we cannot say that we are against the Constitution. Yeah. Uh, and so there were some police officers who were proactive, and some of them, they, they, they knew that there is something risky here in making some uh, big actions. So the Constitution as such, you know, so we are in a moment of building something like the constitutional patriotism. So we lost a couple, 20, more than 20 years on really investing into civic education, into shaping you know, people's minds, uh, especially young generation, concerning what is the constitution. And we are right now on this track. You know, the question is whether we'll be successful in this. So that is the first point. Second point is that, uh, and basically it was, uh, it was mentioned in, in the Secretary Clinton statement about this dilemma, social rights versus civil and political rights. So the government is basically playing with this tune all the time. You know we are guaranteeing labor conditions properly, uh, social housing, you know, we are distributing money, you know, we are looking into different vulnerable groups. So you don't need that many you know, other rights because we are taking care of you. So it is, I think, extremely difficult, uh, especially for NGOs, uh, also for myself as the ombudsman, you know, how to build this narrative. You know how to make this storytelling about mm -hmm. that uh, that social rights are interconnected with your civil and, uh, and and political rights, but you cannot escape it. You know you have to uh, you have to uh, go with this uh, with this problem. And uh, my solution is that I I do a lot of uh, traveling around the country. So I visit uh, I visited uh, up to, uh, until now 100, 150 Polish cities in every city I had a meeting with people talking about different rights so so this explaining listening to complaints you know showing that this constitution is relevant to their life I think it's, it's really uh, important but the last point and I see here uh, as a huge challenge and as a problem is the young generation because you know for young people in Poland who are relatively well off in terms of uh, their life possibilities in terms of you know possible migration to some other European Union uh, member states uh, in terms of education, you know, they don't feel like affected by the current policies. So they don't see a problem as long as it, uh, mm. so, uh, and those uh, reforms made by the government are not affecting that much their lifestyle. There was one situation when the reform was really uh, uh, important uh, to their lifestyle. Uh, it was the reform about creating a total ban on abortion. Uh, so the ruling party was pushed by the Catholic Church to, to, to make a law on this. Um, 
And, but the immediate reaction was a very massive protest of, of women, so-called Black Monday protest. And after this, the government just stopped talking about it at all, uh, but also was warned that you shouldn't touch upon the uh, lifestyle issues. Uh, or maybe lifestyle is not a good word, but like right to respect for your, for your uh, private life. So, so, so the problem is how to attract with rights the young generation when the government is not doing anything significant that would undermine their rights and this connection between, let's say, the independent courts and their life is very distant. You know, so so that, that is, I think, the, 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 the big challenge these days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in Nigeria, generally, um, we use human rights language in pushing for issues of social justice, equality, and fairness. Um, because our background, the fight against the military rule and the transition into democracy saw that we had quite a very vibrant and outspoken media and as well as outspoken civil society. Um, and you would see even in present day times, um, we are challenging the law a lot more, um, either using the national courts and the fundamental rights enforcement procedures in order to push um, interpretation on human rights cases, or even at regional level, using the um, ECOWAS court. The ECOWAS court is a West African um, regional court. And there have been a few cases, like um, recently the Dorothy Njemanzi case against Nigeria, which addresses the issue of women's rights, violence, and how Nigeria could do a lot better in ensuring women have better access to um, the rights protected in the Maputo Protocol and other women's rights uh, instruments that Nigeria has ratified. Uh, but when you now look at other areas, so for example, LGBTI rights, because Nigeria is one of the few countries uh, of very famously who passed a law, the Same Sex Marriage Act, which prohibits any sort of homosexual um, unions and which went further than um, most laws to say where two or three or more people are gathered to discuss anything on LGBTI. So you're not LGBTI, but your subject is on LGBTI. You can be arrested and go to jail for 14 years. So it goes a bit further than, so you don't even need to be caught in the act. You just need to have a group of people discuss LGBTI. So in such situations, you find even within the LGBTI groups, they don't use rights. They don't mention human rights when they meet. Instead, they talk about health access, they talk about sexual and reproductive health, and they remove the rights part of it because then once rights is in it, they think you're trying to fight for LGBTI rights. So groups have found ways in which to um, hide what they do in order to still provide services to the communities they serve. Then when you look at the way um, human rights advocates are being viewed um, as troublemakers, as disruptors, you find that the sort of programs we used to have as children, either in school or at university, are framed differently now. So you can't be a member of a human rights club. You can't have um, an Amnesty International section in your university because automatically, they will see you as either sharing information to Amnesty International, so you're a problem, or they see you as towing the line of activism, which is viewed contrary to the university's policies, or you would need serious um, um, consent from the Ministry of Education in order for you to introduce a club which was not originally in that school. So in, in that case, you, you call it something else. Um, you might still have human rights in the name, but then it's, it's a friendlier term. So more like um, Association of Students for Justice and Equality, because we are so scared of putting human rights in the name of the club, thereby depriving children from the opportunity of getting the knowledge and the skills they need, or even the ability to have debate, to question why are things happening in the country and what needs to change, because we don't want to be labeled as troublemakers, and because we don't want a situation where people are now put at risk as a result of um, joining um, a human rights club. So depending on the context, you can find that the language could be toned down a bit in order to appeal to a larger group of people and in order to kind of offer a safe space for discussion and um, debate. 
Well, I think this is great. We, um, <clears throat> someone uh, mentioned earlier, we were uh, urged to talk about strategies here. I think you've just given us uh, a whole range. Um, Adam's title in Poland, uh, or the law in Poland that creates um, Adam's post as ombudsman, um, uh, gives him four jobs. He is supposed to, um, if I've got this right, prevent, diagnose, uh, he's supposed to do monitoring, and he's supposed to exercise creativity. <laughs> I love, I love that—a legal obligation to be creative. But I think what, um, but I think what you've just been describing from the division of labor you talked about in in your own organization, um, the use of new human rights instruments, including truth commissions and mm -hmm. and other devices. I, I, everyone's going to remember the T-shirts with Constitution, um, and uh, and the creativity there. Um, and, and this importance about the next generation, you both talked about the next generation in different ways, um, but I think the particular struggle we have there um, uh, um, uh, about making, making this uh, uh, live there. Before we go to, the, um, uh, to our, our, uh, our audience, um, let me just ask each of you, if you'd say one final thing about the, about the use of the international apparatus, um, how much how much do other countries, um, uh, other international networks, um, play in uh, civil society's ability to withstand, push back, or continue their work um, in the face of uh, the attacks that uh, in each country? Again, uh, this is, okay. Ahead. Yes. <laughs> so um, Nigeria is considered the giant of Africa, whatever that means, <laughs> and within West Africa, we have a lot of influence. So we, there's a saying, when Nigeria sneezes, the rest of West Africa catches a cold. And that's why there's such a lot of focus on keeping Nigeria together and ensuring that we can manage our crisis, because then the world is going to have a much bigger crisis. You can't imagine 180 million people pouring out of Nigeria into the rest of the continent. And for a long time, um, Nigeria prided itself as a country that respects human rights. We still do. We sit on the Human Rights Council. We like to go on mission in New York, Geneva, to talk about how well the government is doing. Uh, we're one of the few countries um, who has, uh, we inherited the common law system from um, the British that have the African Charter on Human and People's Rights as a part of Nigerian law. So it it's, can be applied in Nigeria as international law as well as domestic law. Uh, we always sign up to everything at the international level. We also set up commissions, and we even amend commissions in order to show how well Nigeria is um, actually implementing these instruments. But in reality, it's always a challenge to ensure that everyone has equal access and equal <coughs> opportunity. And so international pressure has always worked in Nigeria because of the position we hold within the continent and about our sense of um, global citizenship, if I could use that word. And it has always been very useful in causing about change and in making our leaders to think more strategically about what positions they take. Because in Nigeria, our leaders want to look like good um, human rights advocates and protectors, and so are more likely, sadly, to respond to international pressure than pressure from within. And we, this is one strategy we've always used. And that is why the only fight against us is to try to discredit the work we do. Because if they succeed in doing that, then they're able to convince the international partners that we're irrelevant, that we are, we, we are not sure about what we are doing, and effectively delegitimize civil society. And that's why we have to always be a step ahead and we always have to be sure we cross-check our facts time and time again. And we also call on others to also give comparative views of what is happening in Nigeria because when there are more voices, then there's more potential that we are going to get our voices heard at the international level. Um, I think talking about uh, the response of international organizations would be like telling about uh, last three years of my life. Uh, because, you know, uh, at certain point, you, uh, 
you know, like every week you have some delegation, you know, somebody coming. Either it is European Commission or Venice Commission or the UN Special Rapporteur or the Commissioner for Human Rights or Greco from Council of Europe. Like uh, almost uh, all the relevant organizations were were present and monitoring uh, situation. Um, the question is, you know, whether it was effective. Uh, I think that uh, if the perspective is that all those or organizations should stop, should stop the process, I think, you know, we learned that it is expecting too much because the change must go from inside. Uh, but for sure, all those visits, uh, monitoring activities, shadow reports, universal periodic review, uh, all of this, you know, it helped to bring a cost to the international fora. But in my opinion, what was especially important was showing solidarity to people on the ground, like, like a really deep interest into the situation and looking from a different perspective on things that are happening. So, so sometimes, you know, if you are in this vulnerable position that you are, you know, fighting like every day with all those different problems and somebody is looking with different eyes and then is using this human rights framework in order to assess the situation on the ground, it, 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 it may really uh, help. What was missing, I would say, is um, relative low uh, internalization of all those international instruments on the domestic level. So I remember, you know, one day when the Minister of Foreign Affairs made a statement about the Venice Commission. So the Venice Commission uh, appeared and he said something like this, oh, if they are going to make a sightseeing uh, event in Poland, why not? You know, I don't have anything against it. You know, and the general public didn't really understand, you know, what is this Venice Commission, what is the role, uh, so it was much easier to buy uh, that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, uh, words. Uh, and what was also important that, uh, you know, I said about those well-working mm, uh, uh, NGOs before 2015, <coughs> but apparently the fact that they had really good structures be, uh, uh, proved to be helpful in those new times. You know, when suddenly you had to submit all those complex shadow reports, had uh, different cooperation with uh, international umbrella organizations, you know, be active in Geneva uh, or, in, uh, or in Brussels. And uh, this week, you know, I'm waiting uh, for, for a new development, but so maybe, you know, it will be the proof that something was really working uh, because uh, we are waiting for whether the Court of Justice of the European Union will make an interim measure concerning the reform of the judiciary. So if this decision is made, it would make things much more difficult for the, for the government. So we'll see, and, but basically the, 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 the ball is rolling, so you know, we still hope that this uh, immense international pressure may at least you know, delay the process of uh, changes. Yeah. So in Colombia, absolutely, international pressure is also very much of the essence for, for the work of um, civil society. And I already mentioned um, organization, organizations such as Peace Brigades International and others who are doing actual accompaniment on the ground with human rights organizations and social leaders in the, re in the areas, in the very remote territories of Colombia. Um, making it possible to do that kind of work and to continue doing it. Um, and then there are the United Nations, different bodies, special rapporteurs, um, treaty bodies, UPR, and um, the Colombian government, especially under Santos, was always very eager to have um, a human rights language and the language of peace and to be presented and to be recognized as um, a country where human rights matter. And so I think that also was part of what made it possible to push for the respect of human rights through these avenues. And of course, the inter-American human rights system as a strong regional human rights system was also very elemental in, in bringing forward quite a bit of change and as having that last resource where you can go to if it doesn't work uh, on the national level in Colombia itself. And the same goes for another international instrument which is being used in Colombia quite a bit, the International Criminal Court. Um, and there has been ongoing preliminary examination by the Office of the Prosecutor since 2004, for 14 years. So it's been a very long wow. <laughs> preliminary investigation. Um, and of course, it's also in the context of the peace agreement and there are political reasons. But I think that pressure, that under the principle of complementarity, 
the International Criminal Court can step in if Colombia itself is not doing the job well and is not doing the investigations as it should be and is not looking at higher officers, for example, yeah. who might be responsible for human rights violations and crimes against humanity. I think that threat really was essential. Also now, in order to have um, a well-working truth commission and a special jurisdiction of peace, which is supposed to investigate all the different crimes which were committed in, in Colombia, and so to have the threat of the ICC, the eyes of the prosecutor uh, looming in the background, I think really does make a change and uh, is one of the reasons why little things do move ahead in Colombia in terms of impunity. And then of course there's international cooperation which has been essential in, in Colombia for many um, NGOs working there because the lack of resources I think is always present. Um, and also the role of, for example, EU embassies or the US embassy and Canadian embassies um, who um, often also go to, out to the territories and actually visit the communities and uh, send out a signal that it is important to listen also to their voices. And of course there are also other international actors such as multinational companies who also have a role to play in the yeah. Colombian conflict um, and where it needs to be addressed what role they play and what role they have played and which role they should play. And Colombia again was uh, very proactive and was one of the first uh, countries to adopt a national action plan on business and human rights. Um, but again, there's more to be done and the international instruments uh, in that place and international tension and pressure to those companies who are in our countries very often um, is essential to, to bring forward those issues. I think it's really, I mean, I, at least what I take from all three of these um, responses is that the, um, you know, those uh, civil society is sometimes criticized in, in, in every country for just calling on some strong power somewhere in the world to come in and solve the problem. And um, in all three cases, civil society is clear it has to be solved from the inside. This is going to be, this is going to be um, the struggle of the people in the country. But this web that you all have described from ECOWAS to the, to the Venice Commission and all the other apparatus, the, the, the various structures um, playing on Colombia, even the ICC, that web is so much denser today, so much more sophisticated, so much more complex. Um, and, and as you all describe it, essential for civil society to play its own um, uh, role at home, as it were, to really make the difference. 